Thank you, Kenny, and uh, greetings from Bingle Bay in Australia. Sorry about the funny accent. You'll just have to get used to it. Um, okay, I wrote a book called Beyond DNA, and I'll tell you how I came to do that uh, in a minute or two. Um, and the book is subtitled How Epigenetics is Transforming Our Understanding of Evolution. That's not working. Do, 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 do. Sorry, people. Maybe this will work. There we go. Okay, so we'll start with a little bit about me. My publisher told me that I should always start these things with a little bit about what the author is. Um, I grew up in Sydney and I got into science and biology via being a beekeeper. Um, I went to university and studied genetics and breeding, uh, where I got interested in my final year in uh, evolution. And somehow or other, I ended up being a professor of behavioral genetics um, at Sydney Uni. So I never really left, except for two or three periods. I uh, was in Baton Rouge uh, in Louisiana for four years um, in the USDA. And I did a sabbatical in Cornell in 2006. So that was... Uh, that was lovely. Okay. So now I live in Bingle Bay. Bingle Bay is a um, small, tiny township uh, on the coast, uh, about 150 kilometers south of Cairns, which is the most northern city uh, in the state of Queensland. And as you can see, it's very tropical and uh, extremely lovely. And we have cassowaries in the garden. All right, so I'm sure everybody listening to this knows this, um, but I thought it best to start with a definition of evolution and then a definition of epigenetics. And we're doing this so we get off to a nice start that we're all talking about the same thing. So uh, my concept of evolution is that all current life on this planet uh, evolved from a single organism that lived about 3.8 billion years ago. And this is uh, an incredibly important insight because it explains so many things about biology on this planet. So for example, it explains the fossil record. You won't find dinosaur bones with uh, rabbit bones in the same rock strata because they lived at different times. It explains the universal genetic code, the GATC business. It's the same code and everything from a virus to a koala that you see on the left there, um, but with some minor exceptions. So uh, you can't imagine that you would evolve to the same code if they came from different organisms. Evolution explains the distribution of organisms. So we don't find koalas in the United States and we don't find coyotes in Australia. Um, and that's because they evolved separately on different continents and they couldn't get off to go and join other mammals on different continents. Um, and it explains the obvious grouping of organisms. We have koala bears, not really bears, uh, in Australia, and you have bears in the United States. And um, that, that, that is because the koalas... Uh, evolved from one set of organisms and bears evolved from another common ancestor that gave rise to the bears. Um, and it explains the crazy bad design of many organisms. So um, by way of example, you may be aware of the laryngeal nerve, which starts at the back of the head here. Turn around. At the back of the head there, it goes down underneath the great blood vessels of the heart and um, one hopes that they're in good shape as it goes around there and then comes back and gets into the larynx and tells the larynx how to move and make sounds. So this isn't too bad in a human. It's only about, you know, I don't know, six inches down to the heart and back again. But in a giraffe, it's huge. It's a very long way and there must be a little bit of a delay between the thought to make a sound and uh, the uh, actually doing it. So um that no, no no god would have designed such a such a way of doing things it must have got there by chance we even know how how it got there how it evolved it's because it started in the fish um, it's peculiar okay so what's epigenetics 
Um, epigenetics is something which is on top of DNA. It's not really in DNA. So this is uh, a histone molecule. It's a protein. That's what chromosomes are made up of. And wrapped around it is the DNA molecule. And then all along the histones are these little things stuck on there, also stuck onto the DNA. And the DNA and the histone protein sort of talk to each other. And this stops transcription factors from binding to the DNA molecule. So this is one of the major means by which gene regulation occurs. Having these things on there stops the DNA molecule from unraveling and being able to be copied or expressed. So this is a kind of semi-permanent, it's transferred between cell divisions, a semi-permanent way of regulating um, gene expression. And we can have a look at how that uh, works. So this is a fertilized human egg. You know, the two nuclei are about to get together. And uh, it's, you know, a blank slate. It certainly doesn't look like a neuron or a liver cell. But development goes on producing a mature body. And in that body, you'll have different populations of cells including, in this case, brain cells. We hope they're doing well up there uh, in uh, this person and then finger genes on here. So these this population of cells has those epigenetic settings and it, it's not changed between cell divisions. So a neuron will always give rise to new neurons. Uh, things in the muscles of the fingers will give rise to muscle cells, not neurons. So epigenetic uh, processes are central to the development of an organism. But it's also important to realize that these epigenetic settings, this information is not transferred between generations or not usually. We'll come to some of the exceptions later. And this was uh, figured out by this guy, um, August Weissmann. Um, this is an illustration from my book. Um, and uh, he he did the following experiment. It's a bit trivial, but it's kind of fun. He, for 20 generations, cut off the tails of mice. They're the little tails being stored in the mouse jar. And he never um, he, he, he never saw a mouse population arise that didn't have tails. And this is because things which happen in life are not transferred across generations. And that's known as Weissmann's barrier, and it's uh, incredibly important in mammals, not so important in plants, uh, not important at all, really, in uh, things like nematodes, which can acquire characteristics in life and um, pass them to the next generation. But we're not going to talk about that today. So the main thing I want to say is about epigenetic inheritance is that nothing that changes in your life is passed to the next generation. And we've got here this dude, whoops, sorry, uh, with his magnificent muscles from, um, you know, banging the hammer on the anvil for eight hours a day for most of his life. Um, you won't expect his son or daughter, I guess, um, to inherit those muscles. People used to think that, you know, well, look at the blacksmith's son and look at the blacksmiths, they've both got this magnificent biceps and it must be inherited, but it's not because the son earned those biceps um, through similar activities. So nothing in life, nothing that happens in your life like cancer or breaking an arm, you don't pass that to your to the to the offspring. And there's two components to this barrier in um, humans. So the first one is that um, the fertilized egg, the first thing it does as an embryo is strip off all the epigenetic settings. When it's formed, the egg has the epigenetic settings of an egg, right? And you don't want all those egg genes being uh, switched on um, after it starts to divide. So it's somewhere between a sperm cell and an egg cell. It's got to get rid of all those settings and reset them from new so it does that itself that's the first component of the barrier this complete erasure of the epigenetic settings and setting new ones um, as the uh, body develops and the second barrier in mammals is that all the eggs that this woman and every woman and every female mammal 
all the eggs that they will ever shed as an adult are formed when it's in a fetus. So this is uh, the fetus inside the woman and the eggs are forming inside that fetus. And it is only those eggs that will be available to the fetus when it itself becomes an adult. So it's really impossible for anything to happen to this woman, which would then affect her own eggs because she's already got them. Um, there is a possibility, I guess, of affecting the eggs inside the developing fetus. But for the most part, this is a very strong barrier to inheritance of acquired characteristics. So um, I would say that evolution does not proceed via the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And many of you will know about uh, what was accused, or this guy Lamarck was accused of, of saying that there was inheritance of acquired characteristics. This is a you know, a bit of a stretch of what he actually said, which was that there were fluids that are acquired in life that are passed to us. So he argued that the giraffe stretched and somehow this was passed to the next generation. I would say that that is not the case. Anyone know why giraffes have a long neck? Due to sexual selection where the giraffe, adult male giraffes fight by swinging their necks against each other. So this is not the way that evolution works. It's not via something being acquired in life and passed to the next generation. So rather, evolution proceeds by natural selection. And just to recap your memories here, um, Darwin and Wallace said or pointed out that natural populations have variability. So we tried to illustrate this here by the different beaks, a bit exaggerated, but that's okay. Um, so there's variability in natural populations. This has some sort of genetic component because, you know, here you've got the offspring resembling the adult, you know, all these little things you can see which are the same. And there's differential survival based on this variability. So if you think about it, if these three characteristics or these uh, features of life um, hold, then there must be a gradual tug towards uh, phenotypes which are adapted to the local environment, okay? I think everybody in this room would agree with that. Okay, so that's what evolution is. Now we're going to talk about epigenetics. Uh, and we'll start with how I got interested in epigenetics. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I... Uh, from a very young age, about nine years old, I got my first beehive. And one of the most important things about uh, social insects colonies is this caste um, differentiation. So this is a queen bee here with a little number that I glued on her back. And these are worker bees here. And they all arise from exactly the same eggs, not the same, the same egg, but eggs which are laid by the same individual. Individual. So there's no genetic difference between this one and this one. So this is a uh, brood comb inside a beehive. Somebody's cut it off so you can look inside the cells more easily. These are the eggs. Okay. Queen bee can lay about 2,000 eggs a day. That's about her own weight. After three days, the eggs hatch into these tiny little larvae like this. That one's a little old. That's probably one that's just about to hatch. And the larva floats in a pool of royal jelly. Um, if the bees want to make a queen bee, they just select one of these, build this bigger cell around it, and start feeding it like crazy. Okay, so this is about three days old. They can convert them uh, up till three days, and then they um, just feed them like crazy, so forth. And then they, the, the cell is capped after five days. So it's three days plus two days over just two days of excessive feeding of this magic stuff royal jelly that converts the uh, egg or the, the larva from developing as a lowly worker that lives about six weeks and has a sting and pollen baskets and things like that into a queen that can live for three or four years and doesn't have those features so it's a profound difference it's only to do with gene expression and it's um, entirely epigenetic. 
So that's why I got interested in epigenetics. So I hear you say, how does this influence the course of evolution? And I'm going to do this by way of example from a tree that um, grows in Sydney um, called the Sydney Red Gum, uh, Angophora costata. And as you can see from this picture, they can grow to be a massive size. Um, there was one growing in my parents' garden. Sorry, people, very bad. Um, in my parents' garden, it fell on the neighbor's house at one point. And it, was, it was a complete disaster. Luckily, no one was hurt. So they can be like that. Or even in Sydney, if they're growing on the coast where they're getting buffered by winds, et cetera, they can be quite small and flimsy. And this is um, a picture of the same species from San Diego. So very different looking trees. If you were to see them de novo, you'd probably say they were different species. And this is just epigenetic settings, right? The environment is causing the tree to grow like this. So it's changing its gene expression. It's not growing massive and huge like this one. These could easily be the same age. So epigenetics can have a profound effect on phenotype, which is obvious. So how does this affect evolution? Well, I'm arguing here that you can have something like this in an original population. This is again, um, Angophora costata, Sydney red gum. Um, I've just picked these because they're smallish and they're dense and they're, you know, a, an obvious phenotype. Then we're going to say the environment changes some way. So in this case, we're going to say there's uh, regular bushfires. So the, the the phenotype of the tree changes in response to that frequent burning. You have what we call plastic responses. So the tree becomes more spread because of damage. It grows quickly from epicormic uh, shoots and uh, changes its shape. Now, if this goes on for many generations, then you get what we call genetic accommodation. So the new way of expressing genes becomes fixed by a process of natural selection. I'm not saying that natural selection goes away. It's just that without that plastic response at the beginning, um, uh, evolution couldn't have proceeded or couldn't have proceeded as fast. So I think this is a new way of thinking about the way evolution works, that it works via phenotype changing first and then natural selection fixing that new phenotype. So the take-home message of my book is that you don't need genetic, uh, ep sorry, epigenetic inheritance for epigenetics to change the course of evolution. It, you just need this phenotypic plasticity that changes the population first and then natural selection can mould that new population or that new phenotype into something which is more permanent. So the traditional view of evolution, the, what's called the so-called new synthesis, is that evolution proceeds via natural selection on pre-existing genetic variation. That is, you've either got to have the allele there to be selected out, or a mutation has to occur so that the um, natural selection can then work. This is a vanishingly small probability, especially in small populations. The phenotype first view of evolution is that evolution proceeds when gene expression changes first as a result of environmental change, and then that gives something natural uh, for natural selection to work on. And if you think about it, if you have a violent environmental change, if the population can't respond phenotypically first, then it's not going to be there for natural selection to work on. It'll go extinct. So I think this is a, a, a really good way of um, uh, just slightly tweaking our understanding of evolution um, to put more emphasis on phenotypic change before uh, genetic change. Okay, well, I, that's the main message of the book, but there's a few other, well, there, there are many chapters on epigenetics and, and uh, my view of evolution. So I just picked out three examples, uh, fun ones. The first one is genomic imprinting. Um, did you know that in your body, there are about 50 genes, which only your father's copy is being expressed or only your mother's copy is being expressed? So we call these genes 
imprinted genes. And we'll just talk about why that is. This is a clear case of epigenetic inheritance. This is a case where the uh, epigenetic settings are not crossed off when the fetus develops. They stay on, say this gene was inherited from a father, it's going to be on or off. This gene was inherited from a mother, it's going to be on or off in reciprocal. And the reason why this evolves, hint, evolution and epigenetics again, uh, is as follows. Most mammals and lots of plants too, the um, females are fertilized by multiple males at the same time. And so polyandry, multiple mating is very common in uh, across the animal kingdom. For example, the honeybee queen mates about 50 times, some species 100 times, all in one afternoon. It's pretty impressive. Okay, so that, whoops, sorry. That means that in this litter of, uh, is that a rat or a mouse? I think it's a mouse. Um, it's very likely that these individual pups are fathered by different males. And that sets up the situation for the possibility of competition between these individuals. Not only at the individual level, but also at the genetic level. So let me explain that. We're just This is a hypothetical mammal um, that has mated with four males, shall we say. Okay, so here she is. She's mated with these four males. And I've put them in different colours there. So we've got... Um, and we'll take this individual first, this female. She's inherited uh, genes from her father, and we're going to call those patrigenes from father. And then also she's inherited matrigenes from mother. So we're talking about the same gene. It's just that in one case it's inherited from a father, and in the other case it's inherited from a mother. Okay, you will notice, the astute among you, which is all of you, uh, that all of the offspring carry matrigenes with equal probability. But this individual cannot inherit a uh, patrigene because it has a different father, okay? So these patrigenes are different. Now I want you to imagine that a gene which affects fetal growth, like uh, interurine growth factor 2, if it's inherited from a father, then it would benefit from being switched on and switched on hard because it's going to make that fetus grow, this fetus here grow, uh, more quickly in competition with these ones here. And there's no cost to that because these ones don't carry the gene from the same father. Okay? Um, so... That's how these genes evolve, by competition between the same gene in different individuals in the same uh, litter. And this has consequences. You don't want to be the runt. I'm sure uh, many of you have uh, lived with a dog who had puppies or a cat who had kittens, and often there'll be one of the individuals, one of the litter, isn't doing so well. Um, you don't want to be that person or that pup. So um, there are, as I said, about 50 genes which change the expression according to whether they come from the mother who wants all of the offspring to do equally well. The genes are selected to be on at an equal amount. And patrigenes, which is the same gene, but now it's coming from a father, they're expressed differentially to benefit the individual that carries that copy of the allele. And the allele is marked with an epigenetic mark, so it knows that it came from a father and it has to be up-expressed or down-expressed uh, accordingly. So over evolutionary time, this is very interesting. This is um, the thing called the loudest voice prevails hypothesis, and it explains why these imprinted genes, you tend to have one copy on and on hard and the other copy from the other parent off and uh, not being expressed at all. So let's imagine a gene, it, it's optimal expression here is one unity and the matrigene and the patrigene are expressed at the same level. Okay, then we have some sort of ability for the patrigene to know that it came from the father. So it gets upward expressed to get more resources from mother 
the response of that will be for the matrix gene to go down an expression by an equal amount to equal up the two. And you can see where this is going over millions of years, you end up with a situation where the patrogene is on and on hard and the matrogene is totally silenced. And as I said, there's about 50 genes in humans which are like that and about 100 in uh, mice. We say such genes are imprinted and um, it, it has lots of consequences uh, for human health and happiness. So we'll just discuss one of those very briefly. It means that um, gay couples will never be able to have biparental uh, offspring, you know, the two sperm being fused, for example, to produce a, um, a child. And one of the reasons for that, there are quite a few, but one of the reasons for that is that you can't have two genomes with only patrogenes, um, marked as being patrogenes, uh, both being on in the same individual because we'll have double of the required gene dosage. Similarly, you might have uh, genes where they've switched off and then you, again, don't have the uh, correct gene doses in, dosage in the opposite direction. Okay, just a couple of other examples. Um, many fish species change sex during their lifetime. Cheapest. So I'll try to use the, these uh, arrows here. Um, so uh, here we've got uh, a famous eating fish, which is um, um, caught around here, the barramundi. Uh, when they're about a foot long, they change sex from being uh, female to male. And I guess that's something to do with competition during mating. Uh, similarly, you may not, I think these things grow off the coast of Florida. They certainly grow out here on the barrier reef. These are clownfish. And they have a trajectory of life which goes like this. You have undifferentiated uh, juveniles and adults, so they can be of either sex, uh, genetically determined sex. Then um, one of them will become what they call a beta male that is subservient to the dominant female. All right. Uh, if we were to take the dominant female away, killed, then this one will change sex within about 30 minutes. It's amazing. It's not a complete change, but it, it, it starts the process of changing within 30 minutes. And after about two weeks, it becomes the dominant female. And then one of these will graduate to being the male. So the, the, the pathway is from undifferentiated sort of sexless juveniles to a beta male to being the female. Many of you will have seen the movie Finding Nemo, uh, and he lived with his dad uh, on a coral, in the coral reef just out here, sort of where I live. Um, and what and so if it was a dad, well, if that's the case, it would have changed into being a female, and then Nemo would have changed into a male, I guess he already was, and made it with his father. So it's kind of, it wasn't very biologically accurate, people. Okay, um, we're near the end of the talk. I'm sure you'll all be grateful for that. So these are the chapters in the book. What is evolution? We just talked about that. What is epigenetics? We just talked about that. See, you don't have to read the first two chapters. Um, then we talk about epigenetics and evolution. So that's uh, the phenotype first business that I uh, discussed. Then epigenetics in animals, plants, then uh, genomic imprinting and sexual antagonism sex determination, sex reversal, we just did a little bit on that. Then genomics, epigenetic marks change DNA uh, in terms of increasing the mutation rate for certain bases. So it has a direct effect on genomic evolution. Speciation, I didn't talk about that, but it's absolutely fascinating. This imprinting business affects speciation, invasive species. How do genetic clones, like many plants, uh, spread out across the world and become able to adapt to uh, individual environments. They do it by epigenetic means. And then something on epigenetics and human health and happiness and some uh, conclusions. So I would say that's mostly easy to read and I've tried to make it as fun and informative as possible. And I don't assume any knowledge, although a bit of knowledge of uh, gene expression would be handy. You can buy it on Amazon. What was the price? Uh, Oh, yes, $15 on Amazon, which uh, means it's about five cents a page for you to read. And I can assure you that it was a lot of sweat for that five cents a page. 
Um, and I just need to acknowledge that uh, I wrote this on a fellowship when I was at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Berlin, amazing place. They put 60 fellows, scholars in this mansion that you can see there for a year and feed them and wind them and say, go for it. No responsibility. You don't have to produce anything. You just talk and write your book. Just amazing. I also finished it here at Bingle Bay. Come and visit us at Bingle Bay. Um, as you can see, it's a very nice place. And I believe that we're spot on time for a few questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ben. Center for Inquiry has three programs for K through 12 students. And tonight's presentation was for TIES, the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science, which I'm gonna talk a bit about, and then I'll talk about the other two programs. We have a very active Facebook page and website, which is tieseducation.org. And for the past couple of years, I've been programming our YouTube page where you can watch all of our past webinars which we usually have once a month. But also, if you're a teacher, I've created playlists based on themes. So if you're teaching human evolution, we have a playlist for you. If you're talking about genes, DNA, we have separate playlists, ecology, uh, homolog homologous structures, vestigial structures. We have different playlists depending on where you are in your curriculum. And all of our resources are free on tieseducation.org. We have dozens and dozens of icebreakers, lessons, labs. All of our hands-on activities are $5 or free for you to implement in your classroom because we know we're all on a shoestring budget. The only thing that we sell is our book, which is on teaching evolution because we have to buy the book in order to sell it. So that's mm -hmm. why we have to sell it to you. But don't <laughs> worry, we have a special BOGO. Buy one, get one free. So you don't need any coupon code. You can just go to our website and you can get the book for free. If you don't need the physical copy, we have all of the resources for free on our website. And this book was written by members of the TIES uh, core. So there's, I think, 12 or 16 teachers in the book. I'm one of them. If you add up all of our experience, that's like 200 years of teaching evolution in middle school and high school. Uh, classrooms, and the foreword is written by Richard Dawkins. Another program that we have is Science Saves. Science Saves is a nonpartisan effort to promote science appreciation. And uh, just in a week or so, March 26, we want to have a national science appreciation day. Sorry, Ben, we're talking about the U.S., but it could be a worldwide <laughs> uh, endeavor. But we well, first we need a national event, and uh, you may know that March 26, we won National Science Appreciation Day because on that day, many decades ago, Jonas Salk revealed the successful development of his polio vaccine. So if you're in the US and you think your state should participate, you can click on it, um, who's participating, who's celebrating, and then you could write a little thing to your government officials. Right now we have about 20, states that are participating, which we're very excited about. Science Saves has K through 12 lessons in all uh, types of curriculum. TIES is really for science, but for Science Saves, we have lessons in math, language arts, social studies, and also K through 12 for science. And our last program that I'm gonna talk about is Generation Skeptics and this program we are aiming to foster and develop an understanding of the world through inquiry-based learning. So we want uh, our students to be critical thinkers. We want to instill skills of inquiry and wisdom. So we have lots of free resources here as well, also K through 12. And if you are looking for an expert in ghost hunting, magic, OCD, pseudoscience, 9-11 conspiracies, other types of conspiracies, we have an expert that will zoom into your classroom for free. All you have to do is send us a message and we will get you all hooked up. And <laughs> with that, thank you, Ben. That is my advertisement for this evening.
And uh, all right. So Ben, I'll read you a couple of questions because people who watch this after, you know, won't be able to see the comments. Kid, I would like to know, does epigenetics refer to, does it only refer to phenotypical things or could it be um, applied to things like intergenerational trauma? Or do you think that's more of a social passing down? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say that um, it, it's 99% social. So it is it is inherited because you know if if you're abused as a child you you may uh, not treat your child in exactly the same way as a, a person who wasn't because that's what you learned. But I don't I don't think there's much evidence for um, something being stuck on DNA and inherited that causes changes in phenotype across human generations. No. I know it's popular to think so, but I'm mm -hmm. not convinced. Okay, so a lot. I hope you are feeling um, really strong in your clownfish biology because you have a lot of <laughs> questions about clownfish. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll read them to you together and then you can piece out what you know. Uh, Mary <laughs> says, very interesting. This definition of epigenetics is very different from what I had thought epigenetics was. I had thought it was when the extreme stress in your lifetime could affect whether genes would be fully or partially activated than in the offspring. So I thought epigenetics could affect your children and your grandchildren. All right, that was more of the last comment as well. Yeah, okay. So uh, look, there, there are some studies uh, which are um, touted to um, uh, be an example of this. And one of the most famous ones is the famous Dutch hunger winter. So during World War II, um, the Dutch government was in exile in London and they um, ordered a railway strike, okay? They said, okay, Dutch engine drivers, don't drive your trains anymore and this will put pressure on the Nazis. At the time... Uh, the Nazis completely controlled the uh, food intake of the people uh, by a series of ration cards. So they cut the caloric intake by half and there was widespread starvation. Okay. At that time, um, the Dutch, and I think they still do, is that when a child is born, they measure the head, they get the uh, socio and economic uh, condition of the family, um, the weight of the child and all that sort of stuff. And they found that the kids that were in the first trimester um, had different epigenetic settings to kids that were born that were affected by this three months of famine in the last trimester. So the last trimester kids were uh, smaller but the first trimester kids had these changes to epigenetic settings. So that that's the study. But if you start to drill down into it, it's really weak. You know, you end up with the, like the number of people that were actually studied with the epigenetic settings thing in their 50s, like they were fetuses in the first trimester um, in, during World War II. There's not many left but by the time you get to 60 uh, um, back in, in, in those days. So, um, yes, my, my feeling, I went in believing it, but when I looked at these data as carefully as I could, I formed the opinion that um, it's just, there's nothing there. Or if it's there, it wouldn't pass muster in any um, medical journal anywhere, unless it was on this specific topic. All right. So I wanted to group the questions together. So now you get three questions about <laughs> clownfish. Okay. They're cute. <laughs> How does the beta male know that he needs to change? And then somebody else said, "How is the beta male chosen from the undifferentiated clownfish? And then somebody else said, 
what is the actual trigger to turn on the genes to transition from male to female in clinic? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm uh, outside my area here, so I, I, I'm not speaking with any authority. Um, I suspect that there is, like in, in social insects at any rate, you have a hierarchy, right? So amongst those undifferentiated fish, there will be one which is a little further advanced than the others, and it'll be that one that that goes up the pecking order. Um, I suspect that the dominant female um, antagonizes the juniors and keeps them down by biting them upping their cortisol levels, and this uh, keeps their uh, development suppressed. So I suspect it's something like that, but I'm um, speculating. There's a little more than I can remember in the book. So buy the book and you can read all about it. Um, yeah, the, 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 the funny thing, the guy who is the, you know, the world authority on these things, who actually works in Florida, um, his job is at the University of Otago in New Zealand, where, you know, like they have um, albatrosses and penguins and things like that. Um, but he, he's done the work of taking away the um, alpha female or the dominant female and watching the, you know, the changes in gene expression in the gonads and seeing them change from testes into ovaries. It's remarkable work and it's incredibly speedy. Like I said, it's just a few hours. They'll start to change their courting behavior and and the changes in the, in the um, gonads are complete within a couple of weeks. You're not Sorry, everybody. <laughs> You're not the first person I've heard say that. I think it was actually last year for uh, Valentine's Day, we we had an author talk about the sex or queer ducks, like the sex, like the homosexuality of animals. And they also mm. mentioned that Finding Nemo would be a very different movie if it was yeah. biologically <laughs> accurate. Correct. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, there is a section in the book on homosexuality and uh, the theories for um, the inheritance of homosexuality, which has an epigenetic component. Samantha says, great talk. Thank you very much. What would be the role of epigenetics in the gene fate after a genome duplication? Whoa, right. So, um, this is an interesting point. Uh, generally speaking, after a gene duplication, one of the copies will be um, smothered in these epigenetic marks to switch it off or you know, suppress its expression or change its expression so you don't get a double dosage of the genes. So um, the gene duplication process, uh, like so many things, is influenced by epigenetics. Um, mostly about, about getting the gene dosage right now that we've got two copies instead of one. Thank you, Ben, for the excellent presentation. And I put the link to your book in the chat. And for those of you watching it as a recording, it's available in the link in the YouTube description. So thank you, Ben, for doing this presentation. Most welcome. Thanks for the invitation. It was great.